Okay, joining us now on the debate in Calgary, Alberta, Wen Ren Zhang, Special Advisor on China to the Energy Council and Project Director of the Canada China Energy and Environmental Forum. And with us here in our studios, Peter Harder, Senior Policy Advisor to Fraser Milner Kesgrain LLP and President of the Canada China Business Council, and Charles Burton, Professor of Political Science at Brock University, longtime China hand going way back. And of course, we welcome back Daniel Jurgen, author of The Quest. Uh, good to have everybody here at the table. And Wenrang, of course, uh, great to have you on the program again from Calgary. I want to start by just showing, uh, here's the basis for our discussion here. Michael, if you would, bring these charts up here. Uh, two decades ago, China hardly figured at all in the global energy equation. If you look at the line across the bottom of the screen there, the blue line, that's production and it's pretty flat. But now that red line, which is Chinese oil consumption, is going up and up and up. And if it continues at the rate that it's going, it's going to hit the ceiling uh, before too long. Uh, let's take a look at the second graphic, which is China's primary energy consumption, 66% coal. That has obviously huge implications for the pollution content of the world. Only a quarter of China's energy consumption, primarily it says here, is oil. Okay, let's unpack these graphs a little bit and we'll get into this. Uh, Daniel, you're going to get us started off here. Could you briefly describe China's role in the global energy quest today? China is the most dynamic element in the world energy scene. Uh, in North America, we probably reach peak demand. As you point out, Chinese uh, demand for energy is going to just continue to grow very rapidly. It's of concern to the Chinese government themselves. Uh, but they now consume, China now consumes more energy than the United States. Within this decade, it will catch up with the United States in terms of oil. And so uh, this raises major questions for China, and it raises ma major questions for global energy markets. Now, Wenrang, the chart we just showed that showed that uh, basically two-thirds of Chinese energy consumption was still coal-based, that chart's about five or six years old. And I wonder how much things have changed since that chart was... Uh, I guess that's from the BP Clean Energy Research and Education Center. How much have things changed since the, those figures were published? First of all, uh, Steve, I, I must say that uh, the chart has not changed much. I enjoyed your earlier discussion with Daniel. He put things in a good context. In fact, China's coal use in the total energy mix as of last year has gone up to 70 percent. Hmm. Can you believe this is the country in the past five years reduced the uh, uh, energy consumption per GDP unit output by 20 percent. That means China is more efficient in the past five years in using energy, and yet the coal usage has gone up. And as you mentioned, there is a correlation. China is the largest emitter of greenhouses now in the world, and the majority of that, some over 80 percent, comes straight from the dirty burning of the coal in the China energy mix. So China has a long way to go. And by the way, 80% of China's electricity is generated by coal in a traditional uh, burning method. Only 1% of China's electricity is generated by natural gas. And total gas usage, other than you mentioned the oil part of it, uh, gas consumption is 3.8 percent in China's energy total. Mm. So on a global balance, China now stands for about 40 percent of the new increase in global demand for oil, and it's going to go up further. And yet the total energy mix is a very twisted one, heavily used for coal. In the next two or three decades, it's not going to change much. China, by 2030, 2035, will use as much as more than 50 percent of the global coal hmm. consumption alone. Unbelievable numbers. Uh, Charles, help us with this. You know, we have heard this expression, clean coal. Mm -hmm. If they're burning that much coal, do you see any evidence that the Chinese are interested in putting scrubbers on their plants or anything like that? Well, that's a very uh, challenging question. Of course, the Chinese regard themselves as a developing economy and feel that their priority is to get the maximum efficiency out of their energy input. and. I think that their attitude at Copenhagen and elsewhere is that if the West feels China's putting too much uh, uh, sulfur dioxide in the area, and which has an effect on uh, the Russian Far East, that the West should subsidize the, the program for, for reducing the, the toxic effects of burning so much coal. I think that's been an attitude. On the other hand, uh, you know, people in China are not happy about the polluted air either. 
And so I, I dare say it's a development question, and hopefully the Chinese government over time will see that environmental sustainability is also important, not just maintaining high rates of sustainable economic growth. Peter, let me bring you in on Steve, the uh, Chinese. Steve, could I? Oh, all right, Daniel, go ahead first, Steve, then I'll yeah, get Peter. Yeah, if I could just, uh, yeah, just say, I mean, one of the things the Chinese do say is that they're replacing their older, dirtier, less efficient coal plants with newer, more modern, less relatively less polluting coal plants. So that's one change. The other thing that the Chinese also say, as I, I know the other panelists know, is they say, well, actually, uh, you Western developed countries, you have actually exporting uh, some of your energy intensive production to us, in effect, and the, uh, that the energy that we're consuming is, of course, embodied in the goods that you're buying from us. <laughs> yeah. Peter Hart of the uh, Harper Conservatives, when they came into power in 2006, had a fairly frosty relationship with China. But lately that's changed. And I'm wondering whether, as you look at the Chinese interest in the Canadian energy sector, what are you seeing? I'm seeing uh, self-interest on both parties motivating uh, uh, better behavior. That is to say, the Chinese are looking at global markets. Uh, and Canada, because of the kind of energy supply that Daniel has referred to, is a market of keen interest. And you see rather interesting uh, acquisitions on the Chinese part uh, for a variety of reasons uh, to, uh, to ensure both their supply as well as their participation in the pricing of global energy. Uh, and I see Canada as wanting to uh, uh, get the best value for its uh, energy uh, and to balance our dependence on an American market which uh, has two problems with it. One is the slow growth of the American market. The other is, in the absence of some balance of, of uh, supply, uh, you're not always uh, master of the value of your, of your resources. Uh, Keystone uh, being a key indicator, in my view, as to whether or not the Americans are truly committed to a common economic space of North America. Uh, and I dare say, uh, having a, a strong uh, Chinese market for our Canadian energy will uh, help discipline the American behavior with respect to our energy. <laughs> does that make sense to you, Daniel Jurgen? <laughs> uh, actually, it does. I think the, uh, it may surprise people to know that the Keystone XL is probably, along with shale gas fracking, the hottest environmental issue in the United States, and the Obama administration is under uh, a lot of pressure on that. I think there is a, uh, this goes back to the point you made earlier about a sort of uh, uh, two-way street, that there's not a, you know, they don't, it's not taken seriously that, in fact, if China does, if Canada does have this resource, it might well have uh, another market for it and a market to the west across the Pacific. Uh, and I think uh, it would be, you know, unfortunate if we lost the benefits of uh, the kind of closer energy security that would arise from it. But I think that, uh, you know, I think it's important that people in Washington, the United States, do know that Canada actually does have uh, other options. Wenren, I know Keystone has been the hot environmental topic on both sides of the border uh, most recently. But there was another very large energy story dealing with uh, China and Canada uh, not too long ago, this past year, Sinopec and its takeover of Daylight Energy, based where you are in Calgary. This was a deal worth north of $2 billion. Can you just talk to us a bit about why that was such a significant deal for China and for Canada? Well, Steve, in the dollar amount, the Daylight Takeover, just over $2 billion, is not a big amount. But what the significance is that this is following a series of about $10 billion plus worth of other earlier Chinese acquisitions and joint ventures in Canada, primarily Alberta's energy sector, in the past two years, since the bilateral relations warmed up between Canada and China from May late 2009. We see significant movements of Chinese investment in Canada, but daylight takeover by Sinopec, uh, not the largest amount, but it's the first time a 100% clean takeover of a Canadian energy company, which is composed of conventional uh, oil, primarily gas. So everybody is watching here in Calgary and in Beijing on how this deal is going to be approached by the federal government regulatory regimes in terms of approval and uh, whether that will send a signal to the encouragement of further investment in Canada. Remember this, uh, Steve. 
this, all these investments, big investment happening with, from China pouring into Canada without a significant new pipeline to the West Coast. We do have a smaller pipeline system, Kinder Morgan, with a small capacity, but the proposed uh, Inbridge uh, Gateway Pipeline that will carry somewhere over half a million uh, uh, barrels per day capacity is not being approved yet. It's in the process. Even under such conditions, the Chinese have pouring in this amount of money where they invest oil produced and they're all flowing south to the United hmm. States. And they're happy with that arrangement at the moment. Charles, I want to explore a little bit more sort of behind the headlines of what the Sinopec takeover means and what it might imply. And to do that, let me just read this excerpt from the Vancouver Sun from last month. The $2.2 billion takeover of a Canadian oil and gas producer by Asian superpower China signals the vulnerability and desirability of companies whose assets are undervalued in the market, say analysts. The Daylight Energy and Sinopec deal also marks a move away from Alberta's vast bitumen deposits to unconventional natural gas, a resource China has yet to unlock commercially at home. What do you make of the arguments, Charles, that this deal signals, and we saw on the graph earlier, their natural gas is a fairly right. insignificant part of the mix now, this signals a significant move by China towards national gas? Well, I think that's uh, certainly true. If you look at a company like Sinopec, it's you know, it's a state-owned company. It's responsive to the state, uh, state assets um, supervision and administration commission of the state council of the Chinese Communist Party. It's uh, of the of the government of China. It's its head is appointed by the organizations department of the central committee of the Chinese Communist Party. And when you look at its website, the people at the top are the are the Communist Party branch people. And so clearly, you know, it, it fits in with an overall strategy for China to try and, and do things in the interests of China. So, uh, you know, our, the concerns, I think, legitimate concerns of the government of Canada is that if you have a large investment in a Canadian uh, natural resource by an arm of a state, will this company serve the interests of the Canadian shareholders and will it respond to the board of directors of the company or will it respond to the Chinese Communist Party branch that is in fact in charge of this company. Um, and and, and I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think it's clear that these companies are interested in making money, but whether it's in the overall interest of Canada to have this kind of investment remains to be seen. Um, and certainly I think it's something that we should explore carefully and we should have strengthen our regulatory mechanisms and supervisory mechanisms to ensure that, that these investments are in fact doing what they're supposed to do, which is generating benefit for Canada. It may not be, you know, this, obviously it's an expensive business to move the natural gas there, but clearly I think the Chinese government would like to reduce its reliance on coal, and so they may not be acting entirely out of economic factors, but more out of uh, developmental and economic planning factors. And, um, you know, I think it's an investment which is welcomed by Canada as it stands right now. Well, let's find out. Peter, we want the foreign investment. Do we like the strings that come attached? See, Steve, I have a bit different take on this. I think we want the investment, and we want to have a foreign investment framework that uh, is agnostic with respect to source country. We want to ensure that that investment meets uh, a net benefit test mm -hmm. and that the investment company behaves in a fashion that is compliant with our, our regulatory frameworks. That's what we should be focusing on. And I believe that that's what is motivating the in investment from China's part, uh, that there is a, a, a really good opportunity with these investments to not only assure supply in that sense, uh, but to be part of a global supply system in which the price of Canadian energy product is part of how you're hedging your overall financing of your energy uh, needs, which are uh, going to escalate, as the graph shows, for at least the foreseeable future. Daniel, how do you Can think the in? American yeah. government yeah, responds to this? Go ahead. Well, well I was going to say, I think you have to say, I mean, the Chinese companies are very interesting, and one of the things I talk about in the Quest is the evolution from ministry to these international companies that are still majority owned by the state, but are also, when you see them and talk to them, are increasingly acting like commercial companies interested in, in their returns. And I think the second thing is the Chinese government has accumulated this huge amount of dollars that are depreciating, and they actually have a dis interest is in putting them into commodities, into resources that will go up in value, they think. And thirdly, uh, I think oil sands, clearly investment there is a potential 
to bring the oil sands westward uh, across the Pacific. I think on natural gas, uh, the likelihood of exporting uh, natural gas from uh, Alberta to, to uh, China is, is slight, and I, but I think the Chinese do want to gain knowledge of how to do unconventional gas. Uh, CNOC, another Chinese company, has made a several billion dollar investment in, a, in, in unconventional gas and oil in, uh, in Texas, uh, okay. along with a lot of other companies, because this, what's happening this unconventional gas, this shale gas, this is the biggest innovation in energy in the last 20 or 30 years in volume. And the Chinese are, as Charles and others have pointed out, very interested in, in fact, and under pressure from their growing middle class to clean up the skies. And at least in our analysis, it looks like uh, China may have quite significant unconventional gas potential. So I think that they also want to gain the capabilities to apply these technologies uh, at home, and that's, that's part of what the motivation is as well. Daniel, let me ask you just sort of a bit of a pedestrian follow-up here, but presumably you've got you to put the oil in, or excuse me, the natural gas in a pipeline to get it to the west coast of Canada and then somehow get it on a ship to get it over to China. I mean, that doesn't sound like that's cheap to do. Does, does no, the economics it, it, of this exactly. make sense? Well, I, uh, you know, I don't know what Sinopec has said is what their objectives are, but I, you know, I think that exporting Alberta gas's LNG to China does not sound to me at the top of their priorities. It's a huge new supply of LNG coming on board uh, from Australia, which might make Australia the largest exporter of LNG. And then you have this, these unconventional gas. So, uh, you know, I think the focus and uh, when we'll probably have the number of how much the Chinese have put into, uh, into oil sands, I think that's the, the product they're looking on as a potential further way of diversifying their oil resources away from uh, being overly dependent on the Persian Gulf, actually. Wenren, you want to follow on that? Yeah. Yes, uh, there are a number of points, Steve, here. Uh, first of all, the Chinese are now already heavily into oil sands. Although there is no pipeline, they would like to see the pipeline go into the west. And secondly, uh, because of the oil sands investment, our very long-term commitment, uh, we're looking at the Sinopec's Northern Light uh, project with Total would not probably go to production until 2024. That's a very long-term commitment. And that's why you have the shift towards more of the interest uh, in the very lately on the conventional oil, gas, and shale. But the Chinese would want to triple their gas LNG uh, usage in the coming five to 10 years. According to the IEA's 2035 scenario, China's gas usage would be almost equivalent to the total amount close to uh, OECD countries. That's a huge amount. Australia alone cannot supply all that demand. And remember, Australia distance in terms of shaping is further away from Canadian West Coast. There's huge potential because economically speaking, we are seeing on the oil side, in the past year, there's an opening gap between the WTI and the Brent, the two oil index, about $20. If we have the access to the West Coast and potentially export oil to China, that margin of $20 we're now losing going through uh, the South would be significant in some over $20 billion annually in lost revenue. We can calculate more or less but on the gas side, we have about 4 or $5 gas in North America, whereas in Japan, we don't forget Japan is a large LNG importer, South Korea, and China. These are large gas usage importers. The gas there is about 13 to $16. So if we can have long-term, large-scale LNG export to China, globally speaking, we reduce the footprint of usage of coal, which is promoting uh, pollution. So back to Charles' point here, that it is in our interest, not only the Chinese investment to promote Canada, it could be also good for China overall by use, using less coal. I think we can perceive our relationship with China from less of an antagonistic zero-sum perception, but more of a mutual gain. Sinopec is very much a profit-oriented company. When they come over, I do not see them as a purely a state arm because I don't see a plot is going on in Beijing for taking over Canada. So the concern about our sovereignty, Chinese coming in by the state-controlled sectors, is a legitimate concern, but not well-founded. Okay, interesting point. Steve, Let's, Steve, yes, Daniel, Steve, go ahead. I, I, I have, uh, 
in the quest, I have a little scene with the CEO of one of the Chinese uh, oil companies just as they were start, starting to do their IPO, uh, become a public company. And I asked them, the, the CEO, why, you know, you report to the state, why do you also want to invest, report to investors in Toronto, uh, New York, London, and Singapore? And he said, we have no choice. We have to benchmark against the world economy. We have to become modern companies. And I think that's what Wen's talking about, this very interesting kind of shift and somewhat tension that exists within these uh, these significant new Chinese companies that have become such big players in the world. Understood. All right, now that we've established the fact that the Harper government has, um, it's warming to China and is interested in doing more business with China and the Chinese appear to be uh, warming to us and want to do more business here. Peter, let's get into some kind of discussion about what the factors are that are still hindering Chinese investment decisions in Canada. What kinds of things would you put on that list? Well, I think they, the investment decisions uh, track record is actually pretty good. Uh, and that uh, every case seems to build more uh, acceptability that if you behave within the standards of our, of our uh, law, that is net benefit tests, and you behave once you're in Canada according to the regulatory framework, uh, you can uh, continue to invest, and you we're see still that small behavior. Fry though, aren't we? But we're small. Yeah. I think I think the uh, the biggest obstacle to strengthening our our economic relations is the lack of a, of an overall stated and mutually agreed economic framework as our ambition. And uh, my organization has just published a document saying that we should build towards a free trade agreement with China and participate more fully in the in the. Uh, integration of Asia through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other, uh, other mechanisms of Asian economic integration. And that, that aspiration itself would help galvanize all of the, all of the moving parts of a good relationship uh, to achieve a more mature and uh, deepened economic relationship with China. Charles, even though we have a product that they want and even though we have a very stable country, politically speaking, are our complicated regulatory process, um, you know, high, I guess higher labor costs certainly than what you'd see in China. Are those still impediments to China doing more business here? Well, I think the, the main impediment to China doing more business here is probably the attitude of the government, which is still skeptical. Still, about, eh? Uh, oh, I think so. I, I, I don't think there's been a fundamental change in Mr. Harper's thinking on China. Um, you know, he hasn't gone to China this year, um, and I don't think he'll go until there's a good reason for him to to go back to Beijing, um, you know, he wants something substantive from the Chinese government if he's going to go all that way. I, I do think that there are concerns in general about state-owned companies investing in critical Canadian sectors. For one thing, it's not reciprocal. The Chinese won't allow us to invest in their state sector because they regard it as a national security concern. The other thing is that with state-owned companies, they're able to draw on the, res you know, the resources of the state. For example, um, you know, espionage to promote the interests of state companies. Uh, Mr. Harper or the RIM company can't ask the Communication Security Establishment of Canada to help them to find out information that would give them advantages in their dealings abroad, whereas the Chinese state companies are part of the state, therefore they have all the advantages of the state. And then there's the, because it's part of the state and uh, um, integrated with the state, there's a possibility of the Chinese government pressuring us on other aspects of our relationship to ensure that uh, you know, the, the deal being if you're nice to us on, say, human rights and social issues, then we will be nice to you in terms of these uh, investment opportunities. I think another aspect of the security question is that um, Canada is a desirable place for China to come, though, because some of their other partners that they're looking at outside of the Persian Gulf, such as Venezuela, Sudan, um, Iran, you know, are, are nations where their future is uncertain. And, and so Canada is a stable country and, and uh, likely to give China a sort of assurance. So the Chinese are trying to diversify. We'd like to diversify uh, you know, our uh, trade with other nations, but I think that um, there's still a lot of mutual uh, uncertainty about whether this is going to work smoothly and perhaps other countries like Australia are more attractive to the Chinese than Canada. Well, you did say one thing there I want to follow up with uh, Daniel Jurgen on, and that is, I guess we know they spy on us because they get caught every now and then. Surely we spy on them too, don't we? One would presume, uh, I, I guess the term would use it, we, we, would you mean we North Americans? Uh, certainly gather information, I guess you could put it that way. <laughs> we, uh, so hang on, Ch the Chinese spy, but we gather information. Is that the way it works? Well, I just, 
it, it depends what verb you want to use, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think the countries watch each other very carefully. Clearly, there's a lot of concern about uh, one of the things I talk about in the quest in terms of energy security for the future is what the CEO of Sony called the bad new world of cyber vulnerability. And he said that after Sony's website was attacked, it cost him $170 million, <laughs> and it's been said. And I think there is this constant process of, uh, of uh, probes and uh, using cyber uh, 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 attacks of one form or another, uh, cyber uh, entries and so forth. And that is, and a lot of them are, you know, a lot of that's attributed to coming out of Russia, coming out of China. So that's certainly a, uh, is a, you know, is a big concern both for Western governments and also for uh, private companies who want to protect their intellectual property. Peter? I just want to uh, remind everybody that China has options as well. Uh, and I noticed this week uh, Premier Wen Jiabai spoke about the need for China to use the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a mechanism of economic integration. And that's very much motivated by who has oil and who doesn't, uh, and uh, other pipelines that might be in the offing from the former uh, Soviet Union stands as well as Russia itself. So I think we need to, uh, as Daniel's book makes clear, see this as a global geopolitical uh, game uh, and not just one where uh, we've got North America somewhat in a privileged position. We have certain advantages, but the, the game will be, pay, be played on a broad chessboard, and we need to be there. Let me get you to follow up with this, though. You know there is this strain in Canada that we are fearful of being overly reliant on the American marketplace. They own so much of us. We do so much of our trading with them. But their economy has almost flatlined, and China is going gangbusters. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you sense a similar concern in China, or excuse me, in Canada, that we are, in some respects, exchanging our fear of over-dominance by the Americans for a fear of being overly, uh, overly reliant on Chinese business? Um, I don't think so yet, because that, um, that relationship keeps growing. Uh, and I think the, uh, as long as the American relationship is anemic, the American economy is anemic, and the Chinese uh, and Asian markets generally are, are well positioned, we're okay. Uh, the, the, the challenge will be when there are bumps along the road. One thing is absolutely sure. For the rest of our lifetime, the United States will be the number one market for Canada, and China will be number two. And that's the reality that we need to adjust to. The question is just what's the, what's the proportionality of one and two to the Canadian market? Go ahead, and, Daniel. And, 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 yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, if you think about how much has changed, I mean, until 2004, people thought of China as mainly a source of cheap goods, a lid on inflation, a relentless competitor, and some of that is still there. But it's the recognition now that it's a huge market that 20 million people a year moving from the countryside to the city, they need buildings, they need jobs, they need transport. All of that takes energy, other raw materials and so forth. And look what we're watching, what's happening in Europe now. This, uh, we'd say this is a bizarre situation that we couldn't have imagined maybe a decade ago. The Europeans turning to China to help bail them out of their mm -hmm. financial problems. The world, we're living, as, uh, as Peter just said, we're living in a world of great change and some of it is rocky and some of it is just amazing. Wenran, can I get you to speak to that, that uh, premise that I put a moment ago, which is that we're, are, should we be concerned about being too reliant on China as opposed to too reliant on the United States? I don't think so. Uh, the, our proportion of trade with China is rather small, and our over-reliance on the United States now has shown a lot of stress and downturn and potential danger. We have one good customer, but when, when this good customer is getting a bit sick, we don't really have other good customers to turn to. The Asian market, not just about China, Japan, South Korea, India, Southeast Asian countries, they want to come here. The Chinese want to invest here. They want our energy and resources. I don't think they have a debate there. The debate is on our, our, on our side, as this discussion so far has shown, we sometimes are not sure about what we do. As a, as a country in Canada, we worry somehow there's this monster in Beijing using state-controlled enterprises to come and control us. I just don't see that picture. We have a well-regulated economic sector in energy and other places. The Chinese investment so far in the bigger theme of over $150 million, billion dollars invested in the oil sands is rather small. 
the Chinese coming is in minority holdings other than the latest daylight takeover. There is absolutely no reason for us to think somehow there is this Cold War mentality, as Chinese like to put it. I wouldn't put it that way, but we have over concern out of ceases. Somehow, if China gains, it will be our, our loss. That mentality has, changed, has to change. I think there are a lot of benefits for the Chinese investment in Asia. I mean, from Asia to Canada, we need to promote that. Uh, as Peter mentioned, there are others who compete for the China market. We need to be a lot more aggressive. In fact, with all our absolute trade volume increase in the past, I don't know how many years, our trade volume at the China's of China's foreign trade share in the past decade has declined from close to three percent to around one percent. Mm -hmm. We're not getting there as big as the Australians or even the Americans. The Chinese has overtaken Mexico as the second largest trading partner with the United States, and they're on the way to overtake us. Are the biggest trading partner with the United States. These are challenges. I think we need to be a little bit more forward-looking, less concerned, to be more confident in pursuing the China market and the potential benefit out of China. Having said that, Charles, who needs whom more? Well, I think that uh, certainly, um, you know, can the Canadian uh, economy's sustained prosperity depends on our expanding trade with China. There's no question about this. And as Wenran says, our share of the Chinese market has been declining. I think we haven't been putting enough focus and attention into developing that market. I'm, you know, I think the Chinese government does put out a, a line that the United States is in decline and that China is on the rise and therefore if we want to get with the program we should we should start doing more with China. I, that I, is true though, isn't it? No, I, I don't. Well, I, that's I, a true I have line. a lot of... Uh, I don't think it's their line, it's everybody's line. I, I have <laughs> I have more faith in the vitality of the United States to bounce back. Charles, I want to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I do think that, uh, um, you, you know, overall, uh, I think we should be putting, paying more attention to um, not just promoting in China, but also in encountering the possible uh, other effects of increasing integration of the Canadian economy with the Chinese economy. And, you know, we know that there, are, there have been issues in Canada with China-related firms with regard to their accounting practices. Their business culture is not entirely compatible with our own. And we don't really have, up to now, we haven't had the regulatory mechanisms and the police capability to, to, to meet those challenges. Peter? I don't want to talk about any particular uh, business transaction. I want to make the point that um, uh, it's not just China that is rising. It's Asia as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and beyond mm -hmm. Asia, there are emerging markets that we need to pay attention to as well. That really global power is shifting from uh, established uh, industrial democracies that we grew up with as the powerful uh, to an emerging set of countries. And I think the debate is, is nuanced if you broaden it out from just China. If it's just China, it, be it can become a bit uh, uh, too strained a, a discussion. It's really about emerging economies. Uh, and, and population growth uh, in emerging economies. Indonesia is going to be a big player. Vietnam is, is becoming a, a big player. We've got the Philippines. Uh, there are a number of emerging economies that we need to pay more attention to because as they grow, their energy demands will rise and not all of them have uh, energy within their, their territory. So they'll be looking to the global marketplace and how do we play within that is a big question for us. So let's, let's broaden the issue from just China to Asia generally and then beyond that emerging markets. Daniel? Well, I think we can look and see how energy could be a source and, a, and a, a trigger for conflict and tension, whether you look at the South China Sea, uh, other issues with China. But I think we, we're really there's that scenario, but there's another scenario, which is a scenario of a more continually prosperous global economy. And I think we need to put our focus on identifying and, and reinforcing the shared interests that we have so we don't see it as a zero-sum game, because the Chinese could also go in one direction or another. This is a, you know, we're in a new process uh, in the world, and better to manage this so that it goes in a positive direction rather than in a negative direction. Peter, let me follow up on the thing you just said, which is if we start, you know, really focusing laser-like on <clears throat> the Vietnams, the Philippines, Indonesia, not to mention India, Brazil, what's that going to do to our relationship with the United States, which every Canadian Prime Minister since day one has always said is the most important one we have? Uh, I would argue that you start with that. 
uh, the United States is and will continue to be the most important marketplace for us. We have a shared common economic space of North America, and our challenge is to make North America more competitive in the global economy. So we have an interest in the auto sector of North America yeah. working. Uh, we also have an interest in Canada participating in the, in the global economic uh, uh, benefit of its, uh, of its natural resources. But if we go so off we have to do a, both. If we, go, if we go sign a free trade yeah, deal I, with I don't China, think, I is mean, that going to be a problem? It, it, no, the Americans well, uh, have yeah. a number of bilateral trade agreements. Our, uh, the Australians have, have uh, free trade agreements. New Zealand has free trade agreement. My problem is we in Canada have not signed one trade agreement in Asia in the last That's decade. Right. We started over well, a decade ago with Singapore. We haven't concluded. We haven't concluded with South Korea. And we haven't been allowed to be part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership because we won't put supply management on the table. It's time we do because it's in our interest. We've got about five minutes to go. Let me hear Daniel, then Wen, and then Charles on that issue. I think there's. I think that uh, Canada's uh, relationship with the U.S. is generally not jeopardized or in conflict with uh, pursuing those kind of uh, other objectives, which are really being part of a, a, a global economy. Uh, I do think that this one issue, which we talked about before, the Keystone XL, and how that gets decided in Washington, and uh, the fact that Canada does have another option, uh, presumably to go west. Uh, is an important relationship, uh, is important to the relationship. And actually, it's, I think it's important that in Washington, in the United States, it be understood that Canada uh, does have, have its options to go in more directions. It's not going to just be corked up. Wenren? Yes, uh, this is a very interesting set of relations we're talking about. On the one hand, we're looking at, because you, uh, Steve, you talk about this emerging market, the potential of China, Japan, South Korea, India, and Taiwan are together. They consume the same amount of uh, barrel of oil, 19 million barrels per day, equivalent to the United States. Yet, three quarters of those oil will be imported uh, against the U.S. half of those oil. Uh, would be imported. So there's huge market. We know the LNG and natural gas use, all these countries over there are together is about 9 trillion cubic feet vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., 24 trillion cubic feet. There's huge potential market. And yet, on the Canada-China engagement, Chinese investment, Asian investment in general in Canada, what is the picture in the past five, six years? The Americans from big, in the beginning four or five years ago concerned to now quite relaxed because they realized all these Chinese and Asian investment invested in Canada resulting in adding market supply and the oil produced in Canada all shaping south, adding exactly what the U.S. wanted, better energy security. It's an Asian investment invested in Canada representing a pure ad benefits to Canadians and then the oil flow south. Why don't can, can you I say, can I say that formula when, when you've, the when, coming out when of you, China? When you've made a really important point that if the Chinese were not investing to add barrels of oil to the world, given their consumption, we would be a lot more concerned than if they sure. are putting money into expanding the, the supply. Charles wants a word on this too. Well, I think that, you know, the big thing that our Minister of International Trade has been talking about has been to get a foreign investment protection agreement with China. I'm, you know, I'm not optimistic that we can get that, uh, simply because I don't see it in the Chinese interest. Their investments in Canada are already fully protected by our comprehensive rule of law and fair and transparent business regulations. And so I, I don't see what's in it for them to, to give Canada um, advantage in their, in their market. In, in terms of free trade, I find it difficult to imagine that the Chinese would ever open up uh, free trade with Canada because uh, right now they're benefiting from trade that isn't all that free. Well, you're going to get Peter mad with that one. Go well, ahead, Peter. Yeah, yeah, like stand by, stand, stand by, Winter. I, I, I just have a different but, view. But, I, I do think yeah. we will achieve uh, a investment protection agreement uh, in the very next short while. And I do think there is an openness and receptivity for a free trade agreement discussions with Canada because there is a recognition that it is now or we will have lost our moment. Mm -hmm. And now is the time to seize that initiative. When I'm down to my last 20 well, seconds, go ahead. Yeah, actually, we need to have the, our audience to understand that China is the largest economy in the world, has the highest trade to GDP ratio of 40%. Chinese economy is very open. Among that 40% of foreign trade, Chinese foreign exports, 70% of them 
and above produced by foreign multinationals who moved their production bases to China. And we need to go to China rather than saying they're not opening up. China is one of the most open economies, and many of our production bases we don't produce there anymore. We produce in China. As when you've got to forgive me, I'm, earlier, I'm plumb out of time uh, yeah, here, Wen Ren, forgive the problem, me. We need to follow up on that one. Okay, but Daniel, you see what you've done here? You've got a good debate going in our studio. Can we've I thank Daniel Jurgen? Daniel Jurgen, uh, whose book uh, not only do I recommend, but I noticed Fareed Zakaria recommended it on his program this past week as well, or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago. The Quest Energy Security and the Remaking of the Modern World. Daniel Jurgen in our Washington studio, Wen Ren Jiang in our Calgary studio, Charles Burton from Brock University, Peter Harder from Fraser Milner Casgrain here in Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your time Thank you. tonight. Thank you.